Welcome to another episode of Unstoppable Mindset. Thanks for being here and for listening. We really appreciate it. Today, we get to introduce and interview Rodrigo Quesada, but we're going to call him Rod, and he said, that's okay. He asked me if I preferred Mike or Michael, and I said, absolutely. Uh, so he's going to call me Mike, and I'm going to call him Rod, and I guess that works out pretty well. Rod has an interesting story to tell, both about life in in his childhood and what he's doing now. And he's going to talk to us a lot about Scrum, and I'm not talking about rugby necessarily, but but we'll get to that. Anyway, Rod, I want to welcome you too, and thank you for joining us here on Unstoppable Mindset. Thank you so much for inviting me, Mike. I'm very excited to be here. I think uh, this opportunity to be able to share this out with, with, uh, with the team at large, I, I'm, I'm super excited about it. So then again, thank you. Well, absolutely. And you're, you're most welcome. And we're really glad that you're here. Rod, by the way, is in Mexico City. So um, I get to learn new things and uh, refine old things every day. So Mexico City is an hour ahead of us. So it is about 1134 in the morning where I am and it's 1234 p.m. where he is. So uh, uh, he's he's doing this during lunch. So I don't know whether you've had lunch or we'll have to get through this so you can go eat lunch, but we'll get there. <laughs> sure. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's start by um, kind of going back and talking like I love to do about you growing up the early rod. So tell us about childhood and kind of what your experiences were like and and a little bit about you growing up. Absolutely. Um, I think of myself as a fairly normal childhood. I, however, during uh, college, uh, I had a, a car accident where most of my memories were, I, I'm, I'm not going to say wiped out because they're there. They just were kind of <laughs> compressed somewhere in my mind. So I'm able to access memories of my childhood as long as somebody else triggers them. And happens a similar situation with music. I'm able to pretty much sing a song as long as the music starts. But as soon as the music ends, I cannot go ahead and, and, and play it again. And, and uh, I cannot sing it. But if the music starts again, I can sing it again completely. So it's very similar with my memories from my childhood. So as far as I know, it, it was a normal, happy childhood. Childhood, And uh, that's as far as I can go. <laughs> yeah. Did you? So were you always in Mexico City? Is that where you grew up? Or where did you grow up? Yes, I was born. Yes, I was born and I live in Mexico City most of my life. There have been a few uh, projects for work where I have been in the in the U.S. for a couple of uh, it was a couple of weeks and every now and then a couple of months. But but basically that and, and coming back. Uh, yes, remote work for a long time, but but basically in Mexico City. Yes. So you're pretty used to doing remote work already. Yes, actually, I was long before the the, the pandemic uh, that we had the COVID in, in in the year. I believe that was twenty twenty, right? Um, before that, as as communications start to become more accessible, it was uh, becoming much much more easier to to talk around people around the globe at a fairly uh, unexpensive way. Uh, so because of that, it was fairly mm -hmm. easy to work from pretty much anywhere. So I I had the I guess uh, I, I was lucky enough to, to consider myself a knowledge worker and I started doing that since I'd probably say about year 20, 2010 when I was working in the automotive industry. What did you do in the automotive industry? I used to be a, a, a buyer, which later turned into a global responsibility, becoming a category manager uh, specifically for rubber, uh, later on adding plastics and gaskets. So I, I was in charge of global supply in order to make sure our facilities in Mexico and the U.S. had the, the materials they needed in order for us to assemble the products uh, for, for commercial vehicles. Right. Mm -hmm. hmm, okay. And uh, that kept you busy. What When you were in college, what was your degree and what were you studying? Well, my original uh, major was in international business. Um, back then, by the time that I, that I was just about to select my major, uh, the we we start getting some of these uh, agreements like NAFTA, 
uh, where we were able to start sending goods back and forth because before that, uh, there was not a lot of trading among, uh, at least not along, among uh, Mexico and other countries. Uh, after that, it opened, it is wide open and now we have globalization and it's a whole different landscape right now. But back then, uh, mm -hmm. the, there were not as many commercial agreements and it was pretty trendy. And I thought that was interesting and I started out in that route. So did you end up getting your bachelor's degree in that? Originally, yes. Uh -huh. And and once we unfold the story on Scrum, then everything changed and I started yeah. a very different career path, yes. I gather, and we'll we'll definitely get to that. But so when did you graduate? What year did you graduate from college? Uh, that was May in year 2000. From in 2000, international okay. Business. Mm -hmm. And that was around the time you had your auto accident? Yeah, like uh, before I graduated, I, like it probably happened somewhere along the lines of uh, 96, 97. Wow. All right. So it was um, a little bit before you graduated anyway, but yes, that was certainly a, a, a major change in your life. Were you were you laid up for a while or or how did it affect you other than suppressing memories? Well, I, I think on the bright side. <laughs> It allowed me to to have a better give life a, a much uh, broader meaning. I was I was super grateful that I was able to make it. Um, uh, the hit came on my on my side. I, I was driving. It was my fault. I, I I I started moving forward in order to cross, and then a car was coming, and there was no way that it can be avoided. Mm. And uh, it was interesting because I I look into this person's the driver. Uh, it, it was uh, I look at her eyes. And it was almost like com communication that it's, uh, I think of it out of this world. It, it was like talking through, through w without talking, if you know what I mean. There was mm -hmm. like a moment where I was pretty much saying, please, please, I want to, I want to still be here a little longer. And I started watching a movie of, my, before that, I started watching a movie of my life, like a lot of kind of pictures in a super fast pace. And, and that's when I realized that I was just about to no longer be here in this world. And that's when I was like, oh no, please, I, I, I rather be. <laughs> and that's when I make this super quick communication and, and it worked and, and she seared the, the wheels and it still hit me for sure, but not, not in my door. If he had been in my door, I would not be fortunate enough to be talking today and sharing all of this. So. Once, once they helped me realize what happened, I, I realized how fortunate I am to having a second chance in this life to, to make the, the best out of it and, and, and value it and, and savor as much as possible. Of course, it's not always easy, but, but definitely worth uh, attempting to, to enjoy it. Well, and, and it's interesting. I've, I've talked to a number of people who have had major crises in their lives and have had to to deal with that. And um, so many people have said sort of the same thing, that having a second chance and really having the opportunity to go back and think about it, they realize that this second chance gives them the opportunity to try to do more meaningful things and to be um, hopefully better people, but certainly gives them the opportunity to, to go off and better value life and what it brings. Yes, fully agree. Yeah. And, you know, I'm, of course, I had my own experience with that. Needless to say, surviving being in the World Trade Center on September 11th. And, and we had discussions about it, my wife and I, especially when the press started getting our story. And the decision that, that I made and my wife agreed was that if we could help people move on from September 11th by me doing interviews and and also eventually also starting a speaking career. And if we could teach people a little bit more about blindness and disabilities and guide dogs and other things, then it was worthwhile. And as I love to tell people, now being in large part a, a keynote speaker traveling the world to speak, um, it's much more fun to sell philosophy of life than it is to sell computer hardware. So, <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's a whole lot more fun to do that. So I will always do that if I can. It's much more fun to do computer stuff. So I can't complain a bit. Well, so I'm, well, I am very much glad that you're here so we could do this podcast. So I really appreciate, though, that you have learned to value life more. And that's a, a good thing to do. But you, um, 
went into the to the automotive world and how long were you doing that? Uh, I was in that industry for 13 mm -hmm. years. Wow. And then what happened? Okay, it gets interesting. I was into project management, handling these different kind of pro uh, projects, and I was looking for ways to be a little bit more productive as I was doing that. And then I spotted a, a name, a title of a book that was called uh, Doing Twice the Work in Half the Time by the author Jeff Sutherland. And I was like, oh, this sounds like a book that I I, I need to get into, right? So I started reading it and, and that was a pivotal moment in my life, or at least, it, yeah, I know it was in many different ways. Um, so I started reading the book and, and I was, I have, I have the most, I have to try it at least. <laughs> so I try to implement it and I, I was not being lucky enough to say that I was successful. So I realized I needed additional understanding of it. And then I seek out for training back then. Uh, right now, it's certainly it's, it's a bit more accessible to have training online, but back then it was not in by the late year mm -hmm. 2015. But I was able to find a, a place called scrum.org that had uh, this workshop, and I was like, oh, that sounds about perfect. And um, and so so I did. I traveled to the U.S., got this training, and it was it was amazing that the the environment was very energizing and i was like oh gosh this is this is so definitely it and i was able to to connect the dots that i was missing prior to just reading the book and and i came back super excited and i told my boss i know this is going to sound really really uh weird but i want to go ahead and implement it even i i still not an expert on this but i i want to give it a try and if you don't mind, we're going to play roles and we can make it happen if you're willing to allow me to. And and that's the way I start pioneering on using Scrum. So where were you working at the time? Yeah, I was working for Bendix Commercial Vehicle Systems. Um, okay. uh, Bendix, I, I was based on Mexico City with, with an office here, but eventually I also got an office in, in our corporate uh, facility. Back then it was located in Elyria, uh, Ohio, uh, very close to the Cleveland Airport. Uh, about 30 minutes from there. And now they move over to Avon, the, the corporate move over. Um, so back then I was like, why don't, I, why don't we, I don't have a kind of like a team, like the scrum team that I that I can refer to, but I was like, let me make you the, the product owner. And I'm going to be a little bit of a mix of a developer and a scrum master because our organization, I don't know if it has changed ever since, but it used to be uh, kind of like a matrix. So the, the way the teams were set up were very dynamic. So it was not of uh, this is a specific team that we can call a scrum team. But even then, that, that was enough raw material where to get started. And it was the most empirical way to do it. I, I was Back then, I was even using Excel as a way to visually track the, the, the work that was meant to be done. Well, so... Um... First of all, what did your boss say when you said, I want to try to put this into effect and so on? What what was your boss's position? <laughs> I, I, he was one of the directors for purchasing. And aside of the fact of thinking that I was kind of crazy of doing something, so uh, something nobody else seemed to be doing around mm -hmm. us, uh, I, I think it was more of a, why not? <laughs> you already went through this uh, training, so let's let's give it a shot. And and interesting enough, later on, I don't think I don't know if it was because of me or or, or pretty disconnected, but the company had eventually moved over to using Scrum, which I was super happy when I heard they were about to. About then, I was at that point in time, I was no longer with the company, but but it was I was super excited to hear that they were going to do that. So, why Scrum? That is. Um... Why, why that word? Um, give us a little bit of the origins and and kind of maybe start to fill us in a little bit about what this is all about. Absolutely, um, Scrum comes. Uh, Scrum is a framework, right? <laughs> Scrum from two authors, with our Ken Schwaber and uh, Jeff Sutherland. So they together created this framework, and they have uh, refined it and and make it better and better over time. Um, where this idea of giving this specific name, uh, they describe it as referring to the game of rug rugby, where the team is very cross-functional and not like you go like here and I go here and we stay in, in each position. It's more of a, we transition into whatever needs to happen in order to make this work. So uh, th that's where they thought this is almost like 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 doing scrum when you when when you're playing rugby, and that's. The reason why they gave this name of a Scrum to the framework. 
Um, and, and what it happens is that within this framework, you set up yourself in small teams, but each team has everything it needs in order to accomplish its goals. So basically, it's a small unit of people, uh, 10 or less, um, usually, um, that set up a scope and, and, and become or are allowed to become self-organized in order to make uh, everything work. So does that team then work on a specific job, a specific function, or is it more general? Kind of trying to understand a little bit about what the framework is and the whole process. Absolutely. Um, the team is is meant to be cross functional um, because it has to have all the all the all, has to have all the resources needed to accomplish the goals that are set for for that specific team. Now, there will be times where a project is extremely complex and one single team is not going to be able to do everything. So that's where you're able to what is called as scale or scaling, which basically means different teams are working on a small portion of a larger uh, goal. But, but the outputs of the different teams combined allow for this one big thing for a company to be able to, to go happen. Um, maybe, maybe if I go ahead and, and describe how the framework breaks down into its components, uh, that could be helpful to- Sure, let's go. do that. Okay, sounds good. So, so basically, uh, there's uh, three roles, three artifacts, and five- it, it has changed names over time. Sometimes we call them events, we call them ceremonies uh, or commitments, I think the most recent way to, to, to frame them. And basically within a team, you're going to have three roles and there's going to be a product owner who is um, the, the person in charge of maximizing value for the team. And that is a, a person that is a bridge between the customers or stakeholders and the team that is actually doing the work. Uh, so, so that's more related to what we usually think of as a project manager, but this position in a scrum team becomes quite complex. And that's why there's a second role that is created that is called the scrum master. The scrum master accountability is efficiency of the team. So it is more geared towards the inside of the team, which is the communication with the product owner and the other role, which is the developer. So when we think of developer, it, it can pretty much be any function because Scrum can be used in any industry, although it has a natural, a natural fit with, with anything related to technology and software and all of that. However, it can be expanded to pretty much any industry. So that will change the scope and therefore the composition of, of a team. So for instance, let's say in a non-tech uh, kind of team, you could have somebody from marketing and somebody from accounting and somebody from, I don't know, uh, some sort of operations. And Th that team combined is going to go and 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 reach a given amount of goals, um, and and then that's kind of like the three roles of the team: the product owner, the scrum master, and the developer. And the developer are the the people that actually make the work happen, the the goal getters. Let, let's think of it that way. And and the team works as a cohesive unit, which means there's got to be a clear direction of what needs to be done the support and coaching by the Scrum Master and the team uh, actually making that work happen. Once we transition from the roles to the artifacts, that's where pretty much how the work gets managed. You create what we call uh, a backlog of work or, or, or product backlog items um, within this uh, product backlog, which is everything you can build or create or accomplish, basically your list of goals or, or wish list. And so far, uh, am I going too fast? Do you want me to elaborate on any of the points that I already talked about? No, I think you're you're doing fine. Let me let me ask a question though. Mm -hmm. Typically in a team environment, there's a team leader. Is that the scrum master in this case? Ah, oh, that's a that's a great question. It's a complicated question, by the way. That's fair. <laughs> Think of it as a, as a Scrum Master and Pro owner sharing that leadership accountability. Okay. Um, but if you think of if a stakeholder or a customer has a question, who are they going to direct their question to? That's going to be the Pro owner. So in that classic regard, I think I'm going to have to lean more towards the product owner would be that lead. However, <laughs> uh, from a team standpoint, uh, kind of like the leadership tends to, to gravitate more towards the scrum master because 
the Scrum Master is, is willing and able to help the team uh, figure out or solve, uh, actually understand which, which impediments you might have and find a way to solve them. Now, in a, in a, in a great scenario, when you're coaching as a Scrum Master, uh, you're not trying to solve the problem for the team. You're just trying to help the team be able to solve it by themselves. So it's more of a facilitator, but it's also a leadership role. Okay. So if the Scrum Master is more of a coach and a facilitator in sort of the typical language of teams and so on, then what is the the product corner person? It's it's also a leader, um, but but. The, the pro corner will be more centered around the, the product itself than the, than the team or the team efficiency because that's where the support from the Scrum Master comes from. So the pro corner will be more, more related to, to figuring out the requirements and needs from the customers slash stakeholders and translate that into ah. a team in order for the team to work on that uh, value maximizing goal. Okay. All right. Well, go ahead and continue sort of the explanation of how the whole the whole process works. Then, absolutely. Um, so, from uh, from the goals, we go to what are called the artifacts, and there are uh, three. One of them is a product backlog, which is basically your inventory of everything that that we can go ahead and build related to a given product. From there, what you're going to do is that you're going to break it down in a, sm in, a, in a smaller chunk, which is where from everything that we could do, where are we actually going to commit to do? And that's when you go into what we call the, the sprint backlog, which is basically a smaller one with a given time frame in order to be accomplished. And once it is that we usually refer in, in traditional project management as a deliverable, uh, we call it an increment in, in Scrum which is uh, the outcome of work from the team within a given time frame. Now, that will take us over to the ceremonies because that time frame happens to be one of those. But before I move over to the events or ceremonies, any any questions you might have regarding the in, uh, the artifacts or the roles? I don't think so at this point. Um, I'll, I'll keep thinking about it, but I'm just fascinated to hear this explanation. <laughs> Thank you so much. So moving into the ceremonies, there's there's the con the container for the work. It's called a sprint, and it comes from from racing, right? Like like a a, a short a race called sprint. So what you're gonna do is that you're gonna work on something, and it's gonna be a month or less, usually in increments of weeks. So usually you're gonna use the sprints of one week, two weeks, three weeks, or up to four weeks, but no more than four. Uh, reason being, you you want to keep it a, 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 a scope of work that is no longer than that in order for you to make sure you collect feedback, uh, which is one of the, uh, I think, biggest benefits of using Scrum. You're not working on something for a long time and then in the end come back and say, hey, marketplace, look what I got. It's more of I work on a little something and I collect feedback and based on that feedback, I'm able to inspect and adapt. So the team is always working on the highest customer priority or or value uh, value or valuable item. So that being said, you, you set up a cadence of your sprint, which can go from one week up until four. And then once you have the sprint, you start your sprint with a sprint planning meeting, which basically you as collectively as a team commit to a given amount of work and therefore an, an increment or increments by the end of the sprint. Once that happens, you have a daily meeting, which to its honoring its word, it happens on a daily basis. And it's a meeting where you're going to synchronize with the team. You, you want to make sure that everybody is working towards the goal uh, and, and basically keeping the eyes on the ball. Um, and then by the end, uh, close to the end of the sprint, you're going to have what is called a sprint review, which is where you showcase the work that has been completed to the customers slash stakeholders. And it's a great place for interaction and collaboration because basically you're promising something, then you are showing what you have committed to what you promise, and then you get understanding of the path moving forward. Sometimes the customer know exactly what they want, and sometimes they think they want something, but then once they start to seeing that as something they can actually inspect, they might want something different. And that's great timing because Scrum allows for rapid changes or ongoing changes. So I might go on a given route, but I want to change route. Absolutely, let's do it. And that's what 
these uh, sessions are for is is it's kind of like a a working session where collaborate uh, the team, all the Scrum team, and uh, the people that are going to be using the outcome of the work meet to review and um, and provide feedback to each other. And the last event, once that happens, is a, a what is called a retrospective or or retro, where basically just the Scrum team gathers and understand what are the, what is the team doing right, what is the team. Uh, what the team can improve and basically include those small improvements. And that's where the continuous improvement uh, portion comes in because every single sprint, if the team is is working uh, properly, the team is growing better and better over time. Well, okay. So this is clearly a very structured organizational process, which I can appreciate. But you said a lot earlier that that what you really – got intrigued about and what intrigued you with the the whole idea of Scrum, even before you necessarily knew the name was, do twice the work in half the time. So why does this process really increase workflow? Great question. Um, one, one of the answers is because of the communication flow. The fact that you are keeping, keeping teams uh, small enough allows every team member to be able to understand each other uh, if the team is too big, uh, like when you go to a party, right? If there's too many people on the table, you can talk to a few that are close to you, but you cannot understand what is happening by the end of the table. So it, it's very similar um, because the team is small enough, communication flows properly, and uh, therefore you avoid misunderstandings and you're able to communicate faster and better. Therefore, you become far more productive. Um, the other thing that I, that that I think is a part of the answer is the level of autonomy of a scrum team is, is is fairly large. So that allows the team to organize to better suit their own uh, needs, which uh, allows each of the team members to bring in the best of them and, and then combine them into the pool of resources. So the fact that everybody is able to work in such a, a, a pace and the team either failing or succeeding as one, <laughs> I think that's part of the reason why it makes the team so productive. And last but not least, you you every spring you work towards a goal. So there's no misunderstanding of, yeah, everybody's doing a little something. Now, by the end of the of the sprint, we're going to show the work that we have completed. So, so we keep uh, focused and we make sure it happens. So it sounds like in any company where you have um, a fairly decent number of people, you're going to have a number of different scrum teams and each one is is working on a project or maybe uh, a few teams are working on different parts of the same project, but who coordinates all of that? So it, it sounds like there could be essentially a scrum within a scrum in that you've got somebody who is overseeing what the, the various teams are doing. Yeah, interesting question. That That's probably going to change from, from company to company or industry to industry. Um, I think I'll probably should explain that uh, Scrum is a framework. It's meant to work as as a whole. I mean, you don't skip roles or skip ceremonies or increments. You, you use all of those elements. But once you have that basic foundation, which is basically uh, the framework, um, pretty much uh, the rest of it is very flexible. It, it allows for, as I was explaining, like scaling, for instance, if I have a larger project, one team is not going to be able to, to accomplish everything, then we can scale to two teams or three teams or four teams. Um, now, if we are to go that route, then yes, to your point, we're probably going to need to use as an organization some additional tools for managing that complexity uh, across different teams. But as long as the teams are not working on the exact same thing, potentially, you're pretty much just setting goals and letting them go work towards those goals. So, so the self-organization of the teams allows a lot of flexibility for the organizations as well. They just need to set the goals and then the teams go work to make those goals happen. Well, let me maybe phrase the question slightly differently. Who sets the goals? Uh, well, that's what we usually refer to as the stakeholders, but stakeholder can be pretty much... Uh, usually it's going to be like senior leadership levels, 
that are saying this is what we need. So okay. depending on the size of the company, that that's kind of like which level is setting which goals. Uh, but I think it's going to probably cascade down. It's going to be most likely uh, many of these projects going to be top down. Eventually, if, if there are some mature Scrum teams, you, you can actually let them run wild with, can you set up your own goals of what you can actually accomplish and, and make that kind of proposals bottoms up? That's definitely something that can be done as well. Sure. that And I can appreciate that. But in general, what you're saying is that there, there is someone or there is some part of the organization, as you said, the, the top leadership that essentially a stakeholder sets the goals and um, that's where the process begins and then assigns or um, works with the people below them to decide what team is responsible for what goals. Yes, and that's where the communication takes place between these uh, stakeholders and the pro corner in order to break it down for the team to work in that. Right, okay. And so once the goals are assigned, then is it also true that someone keeps the the leadership informed as to how the, the team is going? Or is the idea you have to trust the team and let them do their job for a month and not interfere with the dynamic of the team? <laughs> Great you know question. what I'm saying? Absolutely, yes. I, I guess potentially at some teams that can actually happen. Uh, in my experience, it's more of uh, let's let's have ongoing communication between the product owner and the stakeholders. I, even though we're already working on a given uh, set goal for uh, for for each sprint, um, yeah, it, it usually potentially having this communication helps towards the. At some point in time, uh, good practice to have a roadmap of what you're doing. And eventually that roadmap can, as I said, it can change because of what we think of discoveries, right? Uh, or validated learning. And then kind of think of, uh, there's an amazing uh, book about that by Eric. Uh, oh gosh, he's lying. I, I almost could swear it's Rias. Uh, it's called The Lean Startup. And and there's something, the concept that brings that comes from this book called Validated Learning, which is sometimes, and, and the reason why the scope of these teams is small is because there's a lot of unknowns when you start a project. So there's things and assumptions that that kind of like could hold true over time, but the more the larger the project, the less likely they are. So you have a certain degree of assumptions and you want to go try to test them as fast and early as you can. Uh, which leads to a concept that we refer to in this agile world as uh, you fail fast, which doesn't mean you're trying to intentionally fail. But if you are going to fail, it's better to do it as fast as you can and get your lesson learned and, and move forward because that allows you to experiment a little bit, which pairs well with the empirical nature of this process. And it also helps on the lean thinking um, because you don't want to waste resources. So if a project is going to be canceled six months from now, I rather know what would not what lead that path into that project being canceled six months from now and cancel it, let's say, uh, two weeks after getting started, right? And I'm thinking worst case scenario, right, with a project right. being canceled. More often than not, your project is 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 gonna change paths in order to arrive to one that is actually your successful path. So you go from something good to, to I guess I'm borrowing this from a title of a book, right? <laughs> but but kind of going from good to great, right? Because right. you are understanding your product better as you are building it. And that takes me over to a concept which I think is in the core of everything we're talking, which is the iterative and incremental nature of a Scrum. So what you're doing is building a little something, you do an iteration, and then you stop, you inspect and adapt. And based on your findings, next time around, your next iteration is going to build on top of that. So that's what we call the, the incremental nature because you're always delivering something and it's always better than the that the that the version you delivered before. Can you um, give us an example uh, and tell maybe a story of of a project and how Scrum really enhanced getting the project done? Can you actually is is it easy enough to tell a, an actual story and talk about your experiences with it? Yeah, um, absolutely. Um, I'm I'm kind of thinking across. The, I know the, the that's different examples. It's like oh gosh, uh, it's been a couple of years. So uh, I mean, of of collecting experiences. Sure. Um, 
and and yeah, plus the NDAs, right? Uh, what I can and can't share about specific sure. projects that we just sort of in general. Okay, got it. Yeah. Well, let, let me share this example. Um, it, it happened in one team where we had this cross-functional setup of, of the team members. So each of them having a speciality or, 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 or kind of like being specialists of one thing. And what happened eventually when we start doing the work, there were a couple of team members that were doing a lot of work. Um, and there were some of them that we, we, we see working every now and then. And that make it kind of complex because as long as every you have like two options, right? If you're going to be cross-functional, a little everybody does a little bit of everything. Now, that for sure, nobody's going to be as proficient as the specialist. But the whole idea is that we can rely on each other. So, for example, if our, our programmer gets a stock and he can get some help from the tester, then the tester gets to program a little bit with some... Um, uh, shadowing or help by the programmer, and then they can both program a little bit. Uh, and that's a, a, an example of, of clean cr cross-function. But if, if you're not able to, to do that kind of thing because of whatever, uh, risk and management policies, uh, or, or even willingness by the team members to, to go outside of their uh, usual line of work, and, and that was the case here. Uh, there were team members that said, this is what I do. This is what I want to keep doing. So what we end up doing is if if these team members are, are don't have some tech skills that we need, but there's these other activities that they can do as long as they don't have to mess up with the complexity, complexity of, of programming or, or managing uh, certain uh, technology tools. What we did was simplify that and create a, a web application for for low to no code uh, tech team members to be able to produce work in that application. And that helped because now they can do work in an ongoing basis, opposed to having to wait until there was some no tech work for them. And that helped the team uh, increase the throughput dramatically because now different team members could actually be producing work uh, uh, in parallel, kind of like everybody working on something at the same time. And the, and the output was increased uh, significantly. So with those team members that really were not very technically inclined in the process, it sounds like they may not have really embraced the whole Scrum idea at the beginning, but what did they think by the end of the project? Well, I think by providing them tools that make their life easier and they can actually contribute to 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 the whole, I think that that was a pretty amazing experience for us all because it, it is great if everybody can like go ahead and do different functions, but it's not always possible. So if it is not, how can we think outside of the box and still provide a solution that allows uh, the team to be more productive? And, and that's what we did. And, and it was an amazing experience. And I think that's really the issue here, isn't it? That what you're really promoting is people thinking in innovative and different ways collectively so that you are able to um, fashion and create a solution maybe where you didn't think there was one, but by working together, by functioning as a team and by valuing the team, you figured out, well, We've got to do these additional kinds of tasks to make it possible for everybody to be productive. But that's what it's really all about, isn't it? Is everybody needs to be involved in the team and be be productive. And the team has to be concerned about that and really work to make that happen. Yes, I'm glad you mentioned that. It's almost like as if we're saving the best for last. Um, the definition of a Scrum includes the fact that it, it is creating adaptive solutions to complex problems. And, and where it connects very well with what you just mentioned is that it is more of a mindset. It, it works within a framework, yes, but, but all the pieces working together, it is really about a mindset of, of problem solving in, in a way that, that, let's say, sets up the field in order for you to be very successful. So it, it is a, a tool that embraces uh, change and innovation and problem solving I think to a whole new level. And that's what I think we need in this day and age, because as, as we have evolved as a human <laughs> species, we have also been facing uh, challenges that we didn't have before, like, like, like global warming and, and other things that, that, that are like, gosh, how are we going to solve that? Right. But we got to find a solution because if we don't, our, our, our future is compromised. So 
how do we manage and handle all these projects? And I think this might not be the only way to do it, but it's definitely one way to do it. And that's the reason why I consider myself uh, such an advocate for Scrum. Uh, I think once you do it and understand where it's coming from, I, I think you cannot stop using it. I, I, I can't. <laughs> so you use it in in work and, and, and everything that you do. What do you do now? Are you working for a company now or, or what's your current job environment like? Yes, uh, eventually as I start gravitating towards technology related uh, words and phrasing and things like that, I start exploring into a new career path. And by year 2018, I started a new undergraduate program for computer engineering. And I finished that one in 2020. And then I got into a master's in data science. And about that same time frame, I was lucky enough to join AT&T, uh, where I currently work as a principal project manager, uh, working with Scrum teams. And uh, and most recently, I, I also getting engaged uh, pursuing a, a PhD in computer science as well. So. Once I start gravitating towards technology, I realized my passion for it and that plus Scrum, and it, it, it started igniting me into a very different career path, which, which is what, what I currently do. So did you bring Scrum to AT&T or was AT&T already embracing that as a concept? Good point. I think they're really, uh, for, for this specific uh, project, is something that was about to get started. So uh, pretty much uh, uh, there were a few people getting started with a, with a project, and then eventually there was a significant amount of uh, uh, additional of uh, team uh, members that were hired. Uh, when I started with, with them, I started actually as a Scrum Master. And eventually, by doing the work, I transitioned over to product owner. So I'm I'm fairly familiar with 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 all of the roles. As, as I was also even doing development when I got started in a very pretty cool way since early 2015. <laughs> yes. So as a product owner or as a Scrum master, when I mean that that isn't a a full time job as such. That is, um, you don't just sit in monitor other people, you're directly involved in doing a lot of the work yourself, right? Yes, absolutely. And, Regardless if, of the role, yes. Right. And so you are just as much a part of the working team as anyone else, even though you have the additional responsibilities of being the product owner or the scrum master, which is understandable. When a project is done, this is a question I've always found interesting with different kinds of teams, because a lot of times when there is a, a team effort to do something, when it's all over and it comes time to recognize the teams, the team leader gets recognition and the rest of the team doesn't necessarily get the same amount of visibility. How does that work in a scrum environment? Um, is it just the project owner, product owner or the scrum master that gets recognized or is is the company or the the process such that um, it's understood that it's really the whole team that needs to get recognized, not just one or one or two people. It has to be the whole team, if you ask me, uh, <clears throat> because uh, everybody is pushing towards this successful outcome that is a team outcome. So, so collaboration and teamwork is 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 kind of like the, the glue that bonds everything together. Um, so, even though the the product owner is representing the team and helping the requirements and understanding and communicating with stakeholders. Interestingly enough, um, as as we are used to traditional management positions, I don't kind of think of of neither a scrum master or a pro owner as a, we can think of them as managers. However, from my view, it's almost like not giving yourself that managerial title. In some words, maybe you're doing it, but you are so part of the team that it's hard to tell apart. Um, kind of like, am I am I like like overseeing, or am I actually kind of like so involved that I feel that I'm part of the team? If the Scrum team is is working properly, you are part of the team. So so it's not like different layers of of people managing and people doing. If, even though yeah, true, developers are doing, but you're so close to them that 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 line gets kind of blurry. If you know what I mean, it's it's like. A, there's no way I could accomplish this by myself. I needed the team to to back up whatever I'm I'm I'm, I'm supporting as a pro corner. And similar thing with the with the scrum master. If I'm helping the team become more efficient over time, the team is better and better, and that serves a higher purpose for both the team and the whole organization. 
maybe more like viewing yourself as a, as if you will, a senior member of the team in terms of experience or knowledge level subject matter expert that you're bringing to it, but that doesn't make you better or a, a person who is separate from the team. And I think that's a wonderful concept that you're yes. still really part of the team and it's all about how you best add value to the team. Yes. It's all about maximizing value as a team. Yes. Yeah, that's that's extremely important because in so many teams and so many job situations, the boss regards themselves as the boss and everybody works for them. The team leader is the team leader. Everybody works for them. But they're not, in a sense, as much a part of the team as they really ought to be. Yes, true indeed. And actually, I remember that when they when they created this framework, they they took away titles. They, they didn't want to say you are the senior this or you're the junior that right. because that's more related to a hierarchical kind of uh, structure. They wanted to make it as if you're a developer, you're helping with creating and crafting and, and adding value to the product. So you are a developer and that's it. You, you don't need to have a specific title as you are a QA or you are a software engineer or you are a site reliability engineer, SRE. It's like you're part of the team and that's it. You might have uh, a specialty and, and there's something that I for, almost forgot to mention. Uh, within this world, we're very used to, I do one thing and that I do that one thing very well, but there's this concept of a T, N or M shaped professional, which basically means you're extremely good at more than one thing. So, so you have a broad understanding of several things, but you're good at, at one or more things. So in that regard, there's no limit also to your potential as somebody doing the work. Um, so uh, kind of, it's kind of like a path to mastery and fulfillment. So if you're doing these just like, like well, then, then eventually that takes you to higher levels of, and that in turn <laughs> moves over to your personal life. And then suddenly you have a, a virtuous, a virtuous, virtuous cycle. I believe that's the way, right way to say it, Mike. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so it's, it's kind of like, like it's fun and then work doesn't feel as well, kind of like the way we think of work, right? Because work becomes far more fun and you enjoy it and then you do what you like and then you happen to do it even better because now you are kind of like completely immersed in what you're doing. But aren't uh, Scrum Master and Product Owner titles in of themselves? Or how how is that in the scheme of things different than, than having some other kind of title? No, no, that, that's fair enough. That, that that's where I think Scrum is making an exception. <laughs> we we have these two these two positions that are having kind of like extremely specific accountabilities within the team because for example, right? We only want one point of contact with the team to talk to stakeholders because otherwise there could be 10 people. Sense from a stakeholder standpoint, right? <laughs> you want to talk with one person from the team and that's why it's specific to the uh, Scrum, uh, I'm sorry, to the product owner. Right. Okay. Um, and again, I think that gets back to what I said before, which is really, um, although they are titles, it's really talking more about your level of experience and some of the expertise that you bring to the team. Yes, absolutely. It's, it's a co cohesive unit of, of professionals working together, uh, which breaks down silos, right? Because you're trying to collectively achieve something opposed to this is my part of the work and that's the only part I care for. And this is more of approach of this is what we are working towards building together. Right. And that's what teamwork is really all about or should be really all about. And uh, so often we, we tend to really miss the whole point of what the value of the team is. And we pay more lip service to teamwork than actually doing things to embody it and, and make it really a part of what we do. I know that when I hired salespeople and worked with salespeople, one of the things that I always said is my job um, – is not to boss you around because I hired you expecting that you already know what to do and how to do it. But my job is to add value to make you more successful. And it sounds like that is what you're really seeking in the whole scrum process as well. And why you have a scrum master and a product owner. 
Yes, indeed. And 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 previously you mentioned something about when the project ends, and and I think that comes to a different concept that I found uh, extremely interesting, which is. Um, with your teams being kind of like a group of people working together and the, the longer they can work together, the better they can read each other's mind and, 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 and talk to each other without even talking. Um, if you happen to have a team like that, that is happy working together, um, the other thing that happens is uh, your cost and time is pretty much fixed. So, so the, the, the team from a company standpoint has a given cost, right? And, and time is, is pretty much going, going uh, in, in, in a pretty linear way. Um, what I'm trying to explain is uh, the scope is what's changing uh, over time with the team. So you can, you can start adding new or, or different things to the teams. And if one project ends, uh, a new one can begin. As long as you have a problem to solve, you can leverage on 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 a scrum team or several scrum teams in order to make sure you keep addressing the problems that that you want to tackle as a as an organization or or as a group right it doesn't have to be a company always but we we can certainly use companies as a quick reference point for scrum teams you mentioned um to me in the past that scrum teams don't and scrum and doesn't embrace as much some of the traditional tools like Gantt charts and so on. Why is that? Correct. Um, the Gantt charts are are mainly used within traditional project management when you are considering that all your assumptions are gonna are gonna hold true through the whole life cycle uh, of your project. And therefore, your planning is perfect at the beginning. But as soon as as uh, bottlenecks that were not uh, foreseen in time, or 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 potentially, let's say technical difficulties that that you find along the way, and and those were not accounted for in the original Gantt chart. So usually, what ends up happening is that the Gantt chart starts to deviate along from the actual planning or, or actual uh, action in place. So eventually, you depart from somewhere very different from where you intended to arrive. Um, so what what Scrum does? There, there's there's some metrics that are used, uh, usually referred to as velocity, uh, which is very subjective because it means something different to different teams. So one team have a 50 story points velocity, and our team can have a 500 story points velocity, which might seem that uh, 501 is much faster than the team with 50 points. But it's so subjective that, <laughs> from a working standpoint, the one with 50 points can be actually delivering more work to the to the to the organization. <laughs> but um, anyway, you can have these kind of like burn downs or burn up charts that you can use to track uh, sort of metrics of how the team is doing against the planning. But remember that it's based on short spans of time, so no more than four weeks. So even if you're meeting or, or missing your targets, it's just meant to be contained within a small or short time frame for you to understand, learn, adjust, and do it again, but do it better. What if you don't get a project done in the four-week time that you originally set based on the scrum rules uh, that would be a problem <laughs> most of the time what you do is you break them into, into small chunks that are achievable within a sprint okay um we we can think of and then again this might come back to if i remember correctly uh uh this uh, eric uh Riz and uh, the lean startup there's something called an, an mvp or a minimum viable product which is basically from everything we can do what is the minimum we can achieve. So if you plan yourself to at least achieve a little something and then everything you can add on top of that before the sprint is over, I think that's a safe path to always have something to show for you as a team accomplishing something. Because if you if you kind of lean towards the all or nothing approach, either I deliver everything or I don't have nothing to show, there could be points in time where the risk is high and you're going to show up to the review saying, I didn't complete my work, right? There's nothing to show. So what I'll probably suggest is, is take the MVP path, always have a little something that is something you can guarantee as a team that you can deliver. And then if you happen to have extra time within your sprint, go build on top of that and add more things to here's what we have completed by the sprint review. So if something doesn't get done in the appropriate time, you really have two potential reasons for that that I can think of. One is you made the goal too large, mm -hmm. or two, uh, the team isn't functioning nearly as well as it should be. And that's and in both cases, that's something for someone to go back and reevaluate. And that's where the retro comes in, because every by the end of every sprint, you need to collectively as a team say, okay, where did we miss? Where did we ace? And what do we knew a little bit, 
do we need to do a little bit different to 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 fix that in the future? So you're always looking for ways to becoming uh, better and better as a team, which is one of the things that I definitely love about this framework. Yeah, and that was why I I asked the question because again, it's all about the team making a collective decision or creating a, a collective understanding. And it, again, is all about the team. Yes, it is. Which then can communicate with the the stakeholders and so on in case it's the stakeholder that screwed up. Um, and, and the stakeholder hopefully understands what the Scrum team is all about and will accept the observations when that happens as well. Yes. And there was something else that, 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 that you mentioned that it triggered. Uh, yeah. At one point in time, you mentioned about the team recognition. Uh, the sprint review is not only between this, the product owner and the stakeholders. For the sprint review, you have to have the whole team. So the product owner can be presenting, yes, but the team is there. So there's kind of like uh, very specific questions about things uh, on the of how the product was built or how the product is working or, or any what if coming from the either end users, customers, or stakeholders, that's where the team can bring in their expertise because they build it together, right? So so the team has a voice as well within the sprint review. It's, it's not necessarily only, uh, as to your point, like like just who is managing the team. It's more of, here's a whole team that built this together. And any questions, here's a whole team in order to be able to answer as a team. And that's what really makes this such an exciting concept because it's all about the team and and hopefully when the team completes a project um if they really work together then no one tries to separate the team and put different people from one team on to another team they allow the team to continue to operate and be a cohesive unit yes and there's one more thing that also bonds things together uh, which is one of the pillars of a scrum which is called uh, transparency um, the, the process is extremely visible to everybody in the organization. So what the team is working on, what progress they're having, uh, everybody can actually go see. So what the team is working, uh, these working items, which you usually refer to, uh, or at least I'm used to <laughs> referring to them as, as PVIs or product backlog items, um, everybody can go see what the team is working on and, and how they're communicating and, and their evidences of work completed and everything else. So stakeholders, don't always have to rely on whatever the product owner says. They can actually go and see what the team is doing uh, because the process is extremely transparent to everybody and for sure the team as well. So so usually the, the work is not assigned, the work is is kind of taken, right? How can I help? How can I contribute? So I go to the to the sprint backlog and I grab a working item and, and let's say me as a developer, I go work on that. And every now and then it's not it's not uh, it's not recommended that it's done, but every now and then, even other roles such as the Scrum Master can go ahead and take a little bit of work. Even though it's not recommended, it can be done. So, yeah. Why should more people embrace the Scrum concept of, of doing work? Uh, gosh. Uh, first and foremost, because aside from the fact that it it's, fosters teamwork and increases happiness levels and 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 promotes mastery uh, from the team members, which makes it uh, ever more exciting. It helps you deal with adaptive solutions to complex problems borrowing from the definition of a scrum. So as long as you have complex problems to solve, if, if what you want to solve is pretty repetitive and 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 linear and straightforward, you don't need you're probably not going to need a scrum. But as long as it starts to deviate from something that is that predictable, uh, you can rely on a group of professionals working together as a unit in order to tackle together uh, those those problems and come out with adaptive solutions. Cool. If people want to learn more about Scrum and the process, how can they do that? I'll probably say start out with um, information that is already provided uh, on the Scrum Guide. Um, um, you look at it as that, the Scrum Guide. Um, it was created by Ken, Ken Schraver and, and Jeff Sorland, the creators of Scrum. It's out there uh, on the internet. So, so I'll probably say start there because that's the guideline for the whole framework. And what is it called? The Scrum Guideline. Okay. 
it's it's even trademarked, but it but it is uh, open to the public. You don't have to to even pay to, to in order to be able to read it uh, or, or things like that. And it's been translated to different ED, uh, uh, languages as well. Uh, so I'll probably say start there because that's that's pretty much the epicenter from from the whole framework. However, if you want to learn a little more, there's different books out there and different organizations that can help in in the process, including certifications and everything else. I guess uh, one of them for sure is this book that started me with Scrum, which is called Doing Twice the Work and Have the Time by Jeff Sutherland. That's definitely one of my top recommendations for Scrum. Um, There's also two websites that I I think of that are are scrum.org. And there's other website that is called Scrum Alliance. The dot I believe that is dot com, but if I'm incorrect, that's dot org. Both both promote a lot of uh, conversations and best practices on Scrum. So all of those are great resources. Um, there's a lot more out there, uh, but those are the ones that come on top of mind. And is there a way if people want to talk to you and kind of get more thoughts from you about all this, or just get to meet you? Is there a way for them to do that? Yeah, we, we could probably just link it in for that. Um, uh, I, I haven't had a lot of visibility, uh, but I, I don't mind if I do, because the whole purpose of this podcast was sharing this out loud with, with, with more people. Um, I know what I know, but, but I want that to be spread out because I'm definitely a, a, a Scrum enthusiast. So if there's a way that I can help uh, uh, somebody else, I'll, I'll be happy to. So how can they reach you on LinkedIn? What, what do they look for? Uh, let, let me go seek my, <laughs> uh, 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 gosh, would it be okay if I send it to you? Uh, I don't have it handy kind of like, but, but you can look for my name, uh, Rodrigo Quesada, Quesada with a Z and Regis with a Y in the end. And, and it's, I think it's fairly accessible, uh, once you're into the LinkedIn system. Go ahead and spell all that for me. So <laughs> sure. No problem. Uh, Rodrigo is spelled R O D R I. G O. Mm-hmm. My first last name, last name is Quesada, which is Q U E Z as in zebra, A D as in daddy, A. And my other last name, which is uh, Reyes, R E Y E S. There we go. Yes. So we, we can search for you on LinkedIn with that. So, what do you do when you're not working? Ah, <laughs> uh, gosh. I, when not working, I'm usually doing some training. And aside of that, for sure, spending time with friends and family. Uh, it's a mix of, of those. Uh, I, I I have this reckless pursuit of, of understanding and training, and eventually I'll find my purpose in life. I'm, I'm still on that path. I cannot say I have it, but I always feel I'm getting a little bit closer. So I hope I get there before before my end of life. <laughs> There you go. Do you do you have a family? Are you married or anything like that? Yes, I'm married. Uh, two kids, uh, almost ten. Uh, actually, they're just about to be ten, and uh, yeah, and 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 also uh, two dogs. Uh, so so yeah, I, I, I think uh, yeah. So so that's six in the family. If you get four more, you can have a scrum team. <laughs> yeah, get, getting close. <laughs> yeah, keep keep working on that. Well, Rod, this has really been very much fun and enjoyable. And I really appreciate you coming on and talking about Scrum. It's a concept I have not been familiar with, but I'm going to go learn more about it. I think it's fascinating. I think there are parts of it that, as I listen to you tell it, um, that that I have used in the course of my life, although I never understood it and called it Scrum, but I appreciate it. And I think it's an extremely valuable thing. Anything to promote teamwork is always a good thing. So I want to thank you once again for being here. And I want to thank you for listening to us. I hope you found Rod's explanations and comments worthwhile and useful. Love to hear your thoughts. Please feel free to reach out to Rod and on LinkedIn. And I want to hear from you. Please email me at Michael, M-I-C-H-A-E-L-H-I, at accessibe, A-C-C-E-S-S-I-B-E dot com. Also, you can go to our podcast page, www.michaelhingson.com slash podcast. Hingson is H-I-N-G-S-O-N. You can obviously, as you've already discovered, find us wherever podcasts are available. And I would love to ask you, please, to give us a five-star rating wherever you're listening to us. Give us a five-star rating. We, We appreciate those, but we do want to hear your thoughts and your comments and anything we can do to make this better. And Rod, for you and for all of you listening, if you know of anyone else who you think we ought to bring on as a guest on Unstoppable Mindset, 
please let us know. We're always looking for uh, more people who have stories to tell and things to talk about, and we want to hear from you. So one last time again, Rod, I want to thank you for being here and talking with us today. It was quite an honor for me to be invited. So thank you so much, Mike.